Hello and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I am recording this intro on Valentine's Day. Obviously, as you're listening, it is well past Valentine's Day, but of course I do these intros beforehand. Now, as an, as an adult, I never expect much from Valentine's Day as my husband is not the most romantic guy in the world, but my son kept talking about how the Valentine's Day fairy was coming. He just kept talking about and talking about it. And I said, hey, Benjamin, there is no <laughs> Valentine's Day fairy. So I didn't want him to be disappointed when he wakes up and there's like nothing waiting for him. Luckily, yesterday, my husband went out and got me a card and some chocolates, and my son made me this super cute handmade card that said he loves me so much and drew a picture, and it was just adorable. Now, in full disclosure, I got them absolutely nothing, so who's the romantic one now? Certainly not me. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, I should have gotten them brownies from today's guests, but I am only thinking of that now, and it's too late, but I will buy those brownies. More to come in a minute. Uh, Before I tell you about today's guest, I want to let you know that Rebecca and I are launching our Next Generation Wellness Training from Theory to Practice on April 7th. Now, if you have not heard of this before, we ran it a few times, and this is, I think, our third iteration, and it's a nine-week training focused on how to move away from incentives and the biomedical approach. We're going to talk about why we shouldn't be focusing on weight and what to do instead, And then we're also going to talk about how we can up our game as wellness professionals in the area of value and also with our communication. I'll link up the webpage in the show notes. More to come. We're going to have a webinar coming up in a few weeks, Um, but we start April 7th and we end nine weeks later in June. So on to today's guest. When I interviewed Karen Mosley at Hero a few episodes ago, which of course I'll link up in the show notes as well, she mentioned Grayston Bakery and their open hiring practices. Now, I'm always looking for organizations that are taking an unconventional approach when it comes to their employees. So I thought today's guests, Joe Kenner and Sarah Marcus, were a perfect fit. And let me tell you a little bit about each of them. Joe Kenner is a vice president of programs and partnerships and is responsible for directing Grayston's workforce development and community wellness strategies and activities. Joe was previously the deputy commissioner of what at Westchester County's Department of Social Services, where he oversaw the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, and the Home Energy Assistance Program, among many other initiatives. Prior to his appointment at DSS in 2014, Joe had a 14-year career in corporate America, and he worked in the fields of insurance underwriting and risk management, capital markets, and sales strategy. Sarah Marcus is the Partnerships Manager at the Center for Open Hiring. Sarah recently joined Grayston just last year in 2019 to build out the Center for Open Hiring. In her role, she oversees partnerships with employers, nonprofit partners, and funders with the ultimate goal of fostering the adoption of open hiring. She's responsible for developing the Center for Open Hiring's offering to employers and implementing pilots at companies adopting the model. Prior to Grayston, Sarah completed her MBA at Harvard, where she focused on studying business model solutions to social challenges. Now, before business school, she began her career as a management consultant for Oliver Wyman, advising clients across industries to address complex challenges. In today's interview, we talk about how Grayston Bakery started in 1982 by a Buddhist, and his name was Bernie Glassman, and he wanted to not just start a bakery, but also help the homeless and the unemployed. Joe walks us through that story, and he also tells us about how open hiring process started, because it really started at the beginning, what they do now to support employees as they're starting out, some successes they've had, and I mentioned one because there's a YouTube video that I'll link up in the show notes. It's fantastic. And they talk about quite a few times about (laughs) when I ask about challenges, because any business has its challenges, but they face the same ones as anyone in the food manufacturing business. And let me just say, Grayson's Bakery is no small production. So a lot of times you say, oh, it's just a small bakery or it's just a small organization, so we can't apply it to a bigger organization. But think about this. They supply the brownies for Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So there's a lot on the line if they're not successful. Now, Sarah tells us a little bit more about the Center for Open Hiring and the pushback she gets from talking about it. And of course, an opportunity to, for employers to learn about how they do it. So 
this is a great opportunity if you are interested in open hiring because they have an upcoming learning lab, which is a two-day immersive experience, and it's on March 17th and 18th that you can attend, and Sarah talks a little bit more about that today. Now, before we dive into the interview, let me tell you about today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Realize Wellbeing. Realize Wellbeing is a corporate wellness consulting and training powerhouse on a mission to help companies understand how they're impacting their own employees' well-being. They are dedicated to transforming workplaces into businesses that exude energy and innovation through their vibrant, thriving people. Owner Maggie Goff gets a lot of requests from workplace wellness and HR practitioners who want a fresh perspective on their work and increased capacity for organizational change. In order for Maggie to reach more organizations, she is now offering a brand new Train the Trainer program. This four-week course equips you to bring their innovative strategy to your workplace and also helps you expand your efforts beyond health promotion. This course will help you develop new strategies for your company using the science of self-determination theory and micro-influence. With this new Train the Trainer offer, you'll receive two trainings to deliver to your employees, two fully developed campaigns, a measurement tool, plus four one-on-one coaching sessions with Maggie to support you in your implementation. The April session has limited availability, so sign up today. You can visit realizewellbeing.com or you can contact Maggie directly at mgoff at realizewellbeing.com. I will link all of this up in the show notes, her website, her um, contact information, and I highly encourage you to reach out to Maggie and find out more about this, uh, this course. She is a friend, a wellness colleague, and someone that pushes me to think differently as well. So I know you're going to learn a ton from her if you take advantage of this opportunity. Again, you can visit realizewellbeing.com to learn more. All right. So one last thing, don't forget to share this episode on LinkedIn and tag me for a chance to win a membership to the National Wellness Institute. I'm going to select a listener by the end of February. So just share it on LinkedIn. There is a button on the podcast page where you can just share directly to LinkedIn there. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview with Joe Kenner and Sarah Marcus. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Joe and Sarah, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you both on today. Thank you for having us, Jen. Thanks, Jen. And I guess, Joe, you can kick us off. And of course, Sarah, interject at any point. I know you guys are going to tag team some of these questions, but um, (laughs) I was fascinated by the story of how Grayson's was founded. It was such a unique one. So can you start out by just telling my listeners about the story? Yeah, so Grayson, just so folks know, uh, we're a social enterprise in Southwest Yonkers, and uh, our whole aim is to provide employment opportunities to anyone in a non-judgmental way. Uh, The story of Grayston, and just so you can understand just who we are as an organization, uh, we do this in a couple of ways. One is through the practice and promotion of open hiring, and we do that at a bakery that we have here in Southwest Yonkers. And the the practice is called uh, open hiring, and the what it is, what it involves is basically a, if someone is interested in being a baker at the bakery, they simply fill out a form with their name and contact information. And as jobs become available, you automatically get the job. No questions asked, no interview, no background checks. Uh, that's how we do it at the bakery. But we also have a foundation uh, that provides workforce development training, job skills training, job development, job placement services to the folks in the community that is also done in a very non-judgmental way. And it's to anyone in the community, just like we do at the bakery. It's all non-judgment. We take anyone who comes through the door and we just ask that you be ready, willing, and able to work. Uh, But it all started back in the 80s and around 1982 by our founder, Bernie Glassman, He was a Jewish turned Zen Buddhist monk. Actually, before he became a monk, he was an aeronautical engineer. Then he became a Zen Buddhist monk and then became a social entrepreneur. Um, He and a community of Zen Buddhists uh, 
supported themselves in Riverdale, New York, at the Grayston Mansion, uh, baking cakes. And Bernie found that um, as they were going through this business, he was noticing at that time the high levels of homelessness on the streets in that particular part of Riverdale in the Bronx. And he really saw business, and particularly this business that they started as a way to be um, an agent of change and transformation in people's lives. And he just started pulling people off the street the homeless folks, those who were going through whatever issues, and asked them to work in their bakery. And that really became the, you know, the first phase of open hiring. Um, it wasn't called that at the time. It was just Bernie trying to be an agent of social change in that particular part of the Bronx. Uh, we evolved over time and moved to Yonkers after uh, the community there did not really appreciate uh, Bernie's radical approach to hiring. So wait, wait, wait. Up. Sorry, I hate to stop you on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so what happened that, that they said, we don't like the way that you're just bringing in anyone? To, like, who had an issue with it? Well, if you don't, if you don't know the community of Riverdale, it's a rather affluent area. Uh, so as Bernie's bringing in uh, uh, people of a different uh, flavor to the community, um, it, you know, it led to some disruption in the area. So um, folks didn't take too kindly to that. Mm-hmm. So he moved the community to Yonkers. And um, the bakery has been located here since, I want to say, the late 80s or so, Erica. Mm-hmm. We've been here. And um, it evolved over time, uh, went from baking cakes and cookies to Coming to brownies, and that's also an interesting story um, that we should tell you about. That came about um, also in the late 80s when Bernie attended one of the, probably the first social venture um, conferences uh, at that time. And he ran into two guys, one guy by the name of Ben Cohen and another guy by the name of Jerry Greenfeld. And they started talking about you know their missions and what they wanted to do in life, and they thought it would be great to do some business together since, as we know, Ben and Jerry's makes ice cream and Bernie has this nice pastry business going. They thought they could do some business together. And, you know, Bernie was recruited and the bakery signed on to provide, it was like a chocolate cookie or a wafer for ice cream sandwiches. And, you know, they took all of their money and and everything they had in, in the bakery and invested it in this process to make these chocolate wafers. Problem was when they shipped the wafers to Vermont, they didn't survive the shipping process, and it just arrived in this big slab of chocolate chunks. So they didn't know what to do with that at Ben and Jerry's. So I don't know who actually did it, but someone just kind of chopped up the chunks and put them in the chocolate ice cream, and that's how you got chocolate fudge brownie ice cream. And from there, you know, we've grown to, you know, four or five flavors now with uh, chocolate fudge brownie, half-baked, and brownie batter core, Justice Remix, and our latest flavor with Netflix just rolled out um, this last couple of weeks. And we've always been in their top, you know, five flavors um, for the last few years. So it's been a great journey, but um, one that um, we are mission aligned with Ben & Jerry's, which is a part of Unilever, and uh, other clients that we have that support the mission and support a world-class product, you know, made for world-class customers. That is so fascinating. <laughs> the just story, how it founded, um, obviously yeah. very unique. Yeah, um, yeah. So you, I didn't realize that you all had been with Ben and Jerry's that early in, in the foundation of the bakery. So that has been a, a really long time partnership, which is pretty awesome to have that, that customer <laughs> as, as a founding customer or close to founding, I guess. Now, getting to the open hiring process. So you Mm -hmm. explain, well, just you want a job, then you come in and can have a job. So, and it sounded like there's one thing I couldn't tell, but I think you just answered the question is it it was started right when the bakery was founded, right? So it started when Bernie created it in the Bronx. So it Mm -hmm. was just part of him meeting people, wanting to kind of improve the community and then just get I mean, it, it's just part of, it was just part of Bernie's DNA and you see it both at the foundation level and at the bakery level. And Bernie's, his core belief is just when you see folks that are on the streets, whether they be homeless, on public assistance, substance abuse, at that time, you know, AIDS was a big issue and folks couldn't find housing and other work opportunities. He he firmly believed, and you kind of see it today even being played out, is when folks aren't working, like we're all suffering. 
Um, the whole community suffers. Families suffer when folks don't have a job because that means that, you know, the significant other and the kids aren't getting fed or getting properly cared for. That means that the communities are deteriorating because there's no economic activity and impact happening. Uh, everybody is suffering if, you know, when opportunities are absent from the equation. And that just, you know, got to Bernie's core. And he believed, firmly believed that, you know, business could be a force for change and, uh, you know, transformation at a very basic level. And it began with one job. And how many people does the bakery employ? Total, the bakery has just over 100 folks, 70 of which are open hires. Okay. And so... I was reading a little bit about you all, and it looked like sometimes it can take a while to actually have an opening and <laughs> yeah. get a job. So how has that yeah. worked? Like, and has it, I'm, I'm guessing it's evolved over the years, right? The, mm-hmm. Talk about the so, Yeah, so how it works is, you know, once you put your name on the list, it could be anywhere from six months to a year on average before someone might get a call. And we just introduced a class last week of about 12 folks that were uh, came into orientation. So it, it, it can take a while for your name to be called from the list. But, you know, the good news is if your name is on that list and you, you maintain your contact information, uh, you will get a call at some point. Uh, usually we call in about 10 or so at a time, which means you probably have to call 30 or, you know, 30 to 40 just to, you know, folks move on, the numbers change, whatever it might be, or they're just no longer interested or they found some work. But it, it can take some time before your name gets called. So what uh, I, the- I have to jump in real yeah. quick there. I do, I do think the length of the list shows that there's a real demand and need for, mm-hmm. for places like Grayston and, and, and opportunities without barriers. And so our hope as we think about, you know, scaling this model is that that there will be many employers in our area that will be offering these opportunities. So, you know, it's not just Grayson and maybe they don't want to be a baker and there are other places that they can go. Because you should know, as I think last month we were just over 300, you know, close to 400 folks that were on the list. And it varies from month to month, depending on production and just how many people are putting their names on the list. But it's a sizable list. But, you know, three or four hundred is, you know, small compared to, you know, the four forty four hundred that are unemployed in Yonkers as a whole. So uh, to Sarah's point, uh, wouldn't it be great if I had, you know, 10, 100, you know, a thousand more Graystons that could also be providing opportunities in other sectors that could employ people? Right. Now, are, are the 300 or 400 on the list, which yeah, sounds huge, but you're right in comparison, not so much. But um, are they all from Yonkers? Do people come from other areas um, to get on the list or do they have to be? <laughs> Yeah, for the most part, they're Yonkers folks, but I met a baker one year. She was from New Jersey. Some people are from the Bronx. Some people are from other parts of Westchester County, New York, which is where we are. It all, I mean, it varies, but for the the most part, the lion's share do come from Yonkers. Got it. So where does the turnover come from? Like, how do you, because if you have some, I mean, ultimately you're going to have some turnover, but is there any, where do you get your turnover? So, I mean, turnover happens, it's a bakery. So, and we have 12 hour shifts. So. After a while, you may not like lifting 50-pound bags of flour and sugar, or you may not like working 12 hours, or you just may not like being a baker. So, you know, we don't judge you when you come in, and we're not going to judge you on the way out. Um, Our goal is to make sure we give you an opportunity. Um, We train you on the first day of orientation and, you know, goods goods manufacturing practices, and we talk to you about your benefits package, and you're you're getting paid on day one when you show up for orientation, and you you get access to a 401k. Uh, Once you complete your apprenticeship, which is about six to nine months, you then get access to our union. So we do our very best to provide the support that you need, but... uh, Again, it, it's not for everyone, but our goal is to make sure we provide the opportunity to everyone who wants the opportunity, and we support you along the way. Yeah. Go ahead, Sarah. Did you have something else? Or is that me? Sometimes there's an echo. <laughs> <laughs> You'll edit that out, too. Yeah, <laughs> nah, we'll keep that in. <laughs> so you just mentioned some of the ways that you support employees when they're starting mm-hmm. out. I mean, getting paid on day one, you know, even through their, their use of your their orientation and then benefits, union, all of these things are amazing. But do you all do some other things? Because I can imagine, and what I was reading about you, I mean, people are going to have trouble getting to work, transportation, child care, mm-hmm. all of those mm-hmm. things. So I know you all give some extra support to employees. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so you, you mentioned a lot of the barriers that our folks face, uh, in addition to, you know, some of the traditional barriers, whether it's, you know, a returning citizen or, you know, housing, child care. Those were some of the things we were finding out uh, through the years, you know, why the turnover was so high, because you, you bring in a class and after a certain amount of time, folks just leave and you don't know why, or folks are coming to work and they're just not themselves or something is Something is, you know, skewed. So you start asking around and you're, you're finding out that folks are dealing with various uh, crises in their life, whether it's domestic violence and all the other things that you mentioned. So we found that the solution to that was providing a resource that was outside of human resources. And we partnered with um, one of the largest mental health uh, nonprofits in the county, Westchester Jewish Community Services. And we provide what we call an employment pathmaker in-house um, working with and that, that the acronym for that um, Westchester Jewish Community Services is WJCS, but we have a WJCS employment pathmaker sitting at the bakery um, that deals with all of those other barriers that employees might be facing and makes the connections for them to, you know, housing provision, uh, Department of Social Services, uh, child support issues, child care issues, transportation issues, and really helps them sort through all of that because, you know, Managing this labyrinth of, you know, human services providers, whether it's the nonprofit or the government, can be a challenge. And for folks to understand all of that, it, you know, it's an additional challenge. So it's the employment pathmaker's job to make the connection for those folks, but do it in a way, you know, that's confidential, that's um, supportive and non-judgmental, and developing that relationship with them that's outside of the you know, graced in human resources. It's more one-on-one -on -one and very personal. It's something that um, we, found, we found to be a, a good success um, for our organization. And I would note uh, when we did this, we did a study about a year or so ago looking at our turnover rate compared to the industry average, and we found out we were two points better than the industry in terms of our turnover. And we attribute it to something like the Employment Pathmaker um, that is able to you know, alleviate some of these other concerns that our employees have, and, and more importantly, uh, and get them connected to the services and, you know, solve some of the challenges that they're facing because that it's good for the employee. It's good for the supervisors who also report, you know, the positive change that the employment pathmaker makes in their, in their uh, direct reports. And we see it in the production. We see it in the turnover. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when our employees are happy, that means, you know, our customers are happy and the, the organization grows. Mm -hmm. It's all just sad, you know, I, I don't, that, that pathmaking resource we have, you know, it's, it's, solving issues that are not unique to people that come through open hiring. I think many organizations that um, have entry-level work or, or workers are really, you know, all employees have issues in their lives that may prevent them from being successful on the job. And so our pathmaker actually serves everyone. I could go see her. Joe could go see her. Um, you know, it's really about this, this philosophy of, you know, let's let's try and problem solve the things in your life that mm -hmm. that may impact your ability to do your job well, uh, rather than you know let's discipline you once the job hasn't been done well or once you haven't shown up for work. And, and that's something we the latest innovation with that role is we have now rolled it out to our clients at the foundation who are going through our workforce development training. Um, so as they're getting their hard skills training and their soft skills training, they're also getting introduced to the pathmaker. Because at the end of the day, and I always say this, you know, the clients at the foundation and the bakers, our bakery, it's really the, the same folks dealing with, you know, similar issues. And we just want to make sure that whether they're our clients or the bakers, um, they're still a part of the Grace to family. And we want to make sure that they get the connections to the supportive services and wraparound services that they need. Yeah. So, so it's an actual in-person. You said it was someone sitting on site working yes. with them? Yes. Yes. So. Monday through Thursdays, um, the pathmaker is at the bakery, and on Fridays, they come here to the foundation to uh, meet with our clients at, during our workforce development trainings. So that's obviously a bit different than I know a lot of employers have EAP programs that, you know, may, may fill some of that need, um, but generally is a, you know, a phone call away uh, versus an in-person mm -hmm. that, you know, face-to-face -face type meeting as well as, you know, an EAP kind of has their network of referrals that they make, whereas our pathmaker, you know, really knows that the landscape of the services offered in this community right. and can help our our employees navigate that landscape. Yeah. Yes. And it's very yeah. personal as opposed to, you know, not to knock EA, EAP, but it, you know, they're making referrals, whereas the pathmaker, is, it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's personal, it's case managed, and, it, you know, it's somebody that, you know, they can talk to in, in person. Yeah, that's what I was about to compare it to is EAP, which is traditionally underutilized. But it, it sounds like these your folks like have no problems going to go talk to this pathmaker. Like it sounds like it's a 
Oh, well, I mean, everything you've said is non-judgmental. So I can only yeah, imagine yeah, yeah. That, that they feel comfortable going to talk to this <clears throat> path maker. Yeah, I actually sat in on our soft skills class last week for a few minutes when the employment path maker introduced herself to the class. And I think she got about 10 questions from transportation to Section 8 to housing. I mean, she just got hit with the questions. So you, you, the need is there. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it was good, it's good that it's being utilized. It's a fantastic solution. Now, I'm going to get back to the foundation in a minute. I've got questions about that. But um, you mentioned that Grayson was two points better in turnover than the industry. So what mm-hmm. are, and you mentioned some other business like benefits. Can you just spell out some more business benefits? Because we're going to get to how many employers see this as we could never do this. And I'm sure you get that mm-hmm. question all the time, which we'll get to. Um, but mm-hmm. what are some successes that you've had with open hiring aside from the turnover that you have that's better? I, would say, I mean, the obvious success is that we've been doing this since 1982. Um, this is a business. It's a, it's a profitable business that's been operating uh, since 1982. That's grown over the years and employed more folks, you know, year in and, and year out. So right off the bat, it's a, you know, it's a sustainable business. But I would also say that uh, you know, the turnover is is a big piece of that. I mean, we've seen upwards of you know, is it you know, forty five, you know, four thousand to forty five hundred dollars it costs to hire each person. Um, every time um, someone leaves your organization, um, we're spending half of that in terms of uh, our own uh, costs for hiring. And the other piece is, you know, the stories that we get to talk about, you know, where we can solve folks' domestic violence issues, where we can find housing for our, our employees, where we can get them connected to, you know, services related to child support or child care. And just just the whole loyalty that you know, you see from the employees themselves i think in any business wants that you want good you want good folks but you also want the good folks to stay and that's a great thing about the open hiring model is you know you're providing folks that traditionally did not get a chance to and we we never say second chances we just say opportunity because some folks didn't get the first chance mm-hmm. you're providing that opportunity to folks to work and they are so grateful that they are going to be loyal to you they're going to be committed to you and any business and I don't care who what industry you're in that's what you want good loyal employees i can add a, a little bit on the you know some of the business case points that we make as as we speak to businesses about this it's you know obviously that there's that 4000 number i think it's from the Sure, a SHRM number, Society of Human Resources Management, that's sort of the average cost of, of a hire, and ours is, is much, much lower than that. Um, and we reinvest that money into training and supporting our employees. Then there's also, you know, right now with, with the tight labor market, vacancy costs of, you know, well, what if the roles are unfilled or they have to be, um, you know, filled with overtime because, you know, the business just can't find the people to do the work. Like that, that lost output is is quite meaningful uh, from a bottom line perspective. And we have a list of 300 people and we just call the next, mm-hmm. the next one when we, when the demand calls for it, you know, two other points, one on um, there are incentives for hiring uh, folks who face barriers to employment. There's the worker opportunity tax credit um, that we take advantage of as well as uh, department of labor funding for apprenticeships and on the job training um, to support employing populations that are, you know, from certain demographics and certain, you know, underrepresented groups. And so, you know, businesses can certainly think about those opportunities as they, they think about implementing something like this. And then finally, I think there's this sort of, you know, we have this purpose driven culture um, and there's a, it, it really impacts the whole cult- culture at Grayston in a way that I think is really positive, both internally in terms of motivating all of the staff around our mission, as well as externally when we talk about our brand and what it stands for. And, you know, our customers, you know, they do care about that. And so I think other businesses can think about that as well as they're thinking through, you know, how could this both make good, how can they impact the community, how it can make good business sense, and then really enable their brand to kind of lead the way um, in terms of creating opportunities for people with barriers. And Jen, just staying with this business case, topic for a little bit. We were talking to our our friends at the New York Federal Reserve, and this whole issue of talent acquisition is a challenge across the region. Um, And it's not just the skilled labor that folks are having problems finding people. It's also the entry level. I mean, so you, you think of the productivity that is lost. You think of the folks that are because of whatever it's their background, their education, their experience are not finding jobs and opportunities. What 
would that impact be if folks, and we talked about this earlier, thought differently and had this mind shift in terms of hiring and rethought their hiring policies and opened the door to folks that they may not have hired before or maybe looked at their policies and said, why are we even asking these questions or having these requirements? And you start to bring people in that were traditionally left out. That's economic impact. That's, you know, a job that's filled. That's, you know, a widget that's now going to be made that would not have been made because, you know, your hiring practices were precluding that. So it's a real issue that, that we believe strongly that we're solving in terms of opening the door for folks, but really opening the door to economic impact by bringing folks in. And I know we always get caught up in the narrative that, you know, Grayston is a re-entry hire and we do hire returning citizens, but it's really non-judgment. So it's anybody that puts their name on the list. Anybody that comes through our door here, anybody in this room can put their name on the list and, <laughs> and get a job. So it's not about re-entry. It's anybody that's ready, willing, and able to work um, has an opportunity. Yeah. And I think it's just putting in perspective too, when you think of production, it's like if yeah. you can just call a list, like it's not like when you've got to supply this product to Ben and Jerry's, like people aren't waiting on their ice cream, right? <laughs> they need to get, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's not like it's, you know, a lot of times when you think of white collar work, someone else takes the, the brunt of the load or some things can just be shifted, right? Strategic right. priorities can be shifted, but you're in production. It's not one of those, yeah. you've got to get these <laughs> these products to market. So it's yeah. having that list of people to call is, is a great advantage. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, one of the, um, I watched the TED Talk and I watched, uh, I think his name was Dion. Dion, so, yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> that man He's is still great. here. He needs to be a professional speaker is all I'm saying. <laughs> he got up on that TEDx stage and I've done a TEDx talk and I was scared, uh, scared as hell. And he just got up there and I was like, you, you've got a, <laughs> a speaking career in your future. So I'm going to link that up in the show notes to, to see Dion's story. And you said he's still there, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. you he's pull from he's him, a supervisor now. How it, yeah. So talk about just, you, you can use Dion or you can use another, I'm sure you have countless examples just to personalize, like maybe an employee that you've helped. There's so many and, and it's across, it's, it's across the bakery and, and the foundation. I mean, you, you take a story like Dion's, it's most, that's what most people have seen. He, you know, he had a criminal justice involvement and he could not find jobs at all when he got out. I mean, he was looking and looking and it was only because he had put his name on a list that, Grayston, that he is where he is now. I mean, he started as an apprentice and now he's a supervisor. And as he talks about, you know, he has a home now. He has, you know, a couple of bank accounts. He's got Aflac. He's got all of this stuff. Uh, I, I, I joked with him the other day because he had some um, identity theft issues. And I told him, I said, well, Dion, you're going around the country talking about all this stuff you have. I mean, somebody's going to hit you after a while. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's a great story, but I could go to, you know, folks that are here at the foundation that could say the same thing that have graduated from our, our training programs. We literally just got an email today, someone who's working at our, our hospital that's one of our key employment partners. They're taking a lot of our people. And this person was so grateful because like Dion, you know, the opportunities weren't there for her. And now she has a job making, you know, 17, 18 bucks an hour you know, benefits, you know, access to a union at a great hospital that's in, and healthcare is one of the, you know, top three growing industries in this region. And now she's on a career path that, you know, who knows where she's going to be um, in 10 years time like Dion. We might have another story there. But then there are folks who just got in, came through the door, you know, within the last year that were struggling with substance abuse and through our employment path maker, we're able to get connections to services and they talk about their stories and it's just so encouraging to see like folks lives being turned around they might still be struggling Mm -hmm. and i'm not going to sugarcoat everything but we're helping them and we're working with them because they want the help and they want to change and they want to see their lives transform too so i i mean we could go on and on and there's tons of stories uh whether it's the bakery or whether it's the foundation we could talk about how you know lives are really being changed and i always say Even when you look at the individual that we help directly, it's not just that person that we're helping. It's the kids that are involved. It's the families that are involved. It's the community. So there's that ripple effect of the impact that really uh, touches the community as well. Yeah. 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 And so many employers don't think about the community as a whole. (laughs) So I'm glad that you do. And uh, you just said, but not sugarcoating. So I imagine... With any and with anything, like any business, there's challenges along the way, and you put something like open hiring in, and it's just 
there's going to be challenges. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but is there anything mm-hmm. that you've learned? And I'm sure you've learned a ton in the past 20 years or so, but anything recently that you're continuing to, to learn with open hiring? I would say, I mean, the one thing that we did learn was instituting the employment pathmaker role and doing that through a partner that has the expertise uh, to make the connections in the community. Uh, for us as a business, that was important. For us as you know, a nonprofit that's working with this population, it's good to have those connections uh, to uh, human services. So th- I think that was a key piece. But, you know, as Sarah and and part of Sarah's role is to see this model replicated is we're now seeing the interest of other folks, other businesses talking about how can they do it. And, you know, you don't have to do it exactly the way we do it. But, you know, again, going back to our earlier conversation, it's thinking differently and having that mind shift. uh, And how do we now help other organizations do that? is that's that's I think the biggest innovation that we're making right now is really replicating the model and and assisting other organizations to uh, figure out how they can be more inclusive with their hiring practices and I and I would say that's another area where we've done a very good job of uh, taking the model to the next level um, and Sarah could talk about some of the folks we're working with directly but I could say going back to the hospital that uh, we've been working with lately, they see the great work that we do in terms of training folks and getting folks work ready. They've been hired. They hired about 25% of my placements last year. And these are jobs that are in the 17, 18 bucks range. And the minimum wage in New York State is $13. So that says something. And these are not just, you know, run-of-the-mill jobs. These are jobs where you will get a pathway to another career, um, either within that hospital or somewhere else. But you also get benefits, you get union, and you're working for a huge organization that's growing. So when we hear stories like that, we, we know we're on to something, and, and we know the impact that we're having not just um, with the individual, but it's with the organizations, it's with their families, and you know we want to take this to the next level. So we're going to be on as many podcasts like these as we can, so you can get that message out for us. Yeah. I would just add to, you know, in terms of day-to-day challenges, ours are pretty much the same as any other yeah. manufacturing business. You know, it's efficiency and productivity and getting the product out the door and managing the ups and downs of the business, managing scheduling, you know, to those ups and downs in terms of, you know, the employees themselves, it's, it's attendance, you know, yes, we have our path maker to support with that. And we think that does make a difference, but that is, you know, still an issue for us. And that's basically the top issue for most of the, the businesses we talk to. Um, but I think there are maybe perceptions out there that, you know, are, we have this, you know, crazy facility where people are throwing flour at each other and it just must must be chaos and mayhem. And <laughs> and when you come visit, it, it looks like, you know, a world-class manufacturing facility, which it is because we supply, you know, a multi-billion dollar um, company in Unilever. And so they, you know, yes, they love our mission, but they wouldn't accept anything less than to their standards in terms of our brownies. Mm-hmm. And so it, it really is uh, like any any other business in terms of, you know, what it looks and feels like and the challenges we face. We just happen to hire the next person through the door when we have jobs available. And I would say the, the one challenge we don't have is finding people because we have yes, a list yes. of 300 or 400 people. So to Sarah's point, uh, you know, we get that question a lot, like, because you're doing open hiring, what are these challenges? And and, and we really have to, like, you know, kill that uh, stereotype. It, we're a manufacturing facility. We're a business like any other business. Uh, we're going to have employee issues and conflicts like any other business. And we have insurance like any other business. And we pay the same insurance rates as any other industry, um, you know, in this in this sector would pay for insurance. So there's nothing different about us in terms of operations or challenges. We just have a radically different way of getting people in the door. And the one challenge I go back to is we don't have is getting people. And I have a list of 300, 400 people. How many do you have? <laughs> well, I think thinking, even thinking about all the resources that you offer yeah. people, I mean, like uh, most employers don't. And you're saying like one of the challenges was like, just finding that right fit to help your, your folks. Right. And I think just mm-hmm. most employers aren't committing that type of resource yeah. to their, to their people. And that's something that maybe you notice that we need to we just need to provide and, more, more support. And, and Sarah hit on it earlier. It's like, the same issues are happening in any other organization. Everybody's dealing with childcare, everybody's dealing with transportation or any other of these social issues that, you know, folks are facing. We just want our folks to be open and honest with us about it and have that reciprocal give, give and take so that we can help you. 
because I, I think the goal is for you to stay here and to thrive here and not only here, but at home and in your community. So to the extent we could provide that support and the wraparound, we want to make it happen because we want you to grow here and want you to stay here. Well, Joe, consider the myth busted. You guys, <laughs> we're good. My job is done. I can go now. Drop the mic. Drop the mic. We're good. <laughs> it's such an important point. I've got a, a friend who's in HR in the hospitality industry, and it, it is just they can't find people, right? So they not only have the same challenges everyone else has, but they also have that we can't even find people to to, to work. So um, there you go. That, that you, you've accomplished, mission accomplished. Um, <laughs> and so now you help other companies. So the Grayson Center for Open Hiring was just open, right? So 2018 um, to help the other, other companies. And so talk about, and you've referred to a few things, but when I mean, you have, I think, something coming up in, in March, but what do you do at the center? How do you help companies with this open hiring model? Yeah, so, so as you said, the center was just established um, about a year and a half ago with this thinking that, you know, to really maximize our impact, yes, we can grow the brownie business and we will continue to do so, but we could have an even much broader impact if we could convince every employer to think about how they can remove barriers to employment or to find the job for which they could hire the next person through the door. Um, and so that was the thinking behind establishing the center. And I think what's interesting about the evolution is that it was really launched as this kind of social social justice effort and mission, um, you know, because of the strong be- belief in the values that underlie how we hire. And that, that's still very much a core foundation of what we do. But because of the current labor market, um, and I think just increased it, it attention um, among employers about, you know, how they support their employee, how they better can better support their employees, um, and with unemployment so low as it is, you know, how they can find people and retain them. Um, and so it's, you know, shifted a little bit to more focus on addressing that need um, through the lens lens of open hiring. In terms of how we actually do this, uh, we we have a training uh, that we offer, a two-day immersive learning experience that we call the Grayston Learning Lab. Um, as you mentioned, we have one upcoming in March uh, 17th and 18th. So listeners who are interested, we definitely want to, you know, get out the information about that for those that are interested in attending. Um, And that's an opportunity for employers to come on site, really get a feel for what is open hiring, how do we do what we do, get to tour our bakery facility, ask us all the tough questions that, you know, that they're maybe afraid of asking. Uh, We really want to, like, get those out in the open and address some of the myths, the realities um, of our model. And then we spend the honestly more probably the majority of the time on um, helping them think through okay what could this look like in our organization, um, and one one thing I think it's important to note about the center is that yes we're trying to scale our model of open hiring but we're not expecting every organization or company to do it exactly the way Grayson does you know where we have exactly you know zero barriers um, and the majority of our workforce has come through open hiring. We would love it if all if employers took up that mantle and, and adopted the model that way, but we understand that that's likely not the case. And so we don't want perfect to be the enemy of good. And so we're working with companies on figuring out what makes sense for them. What are the roles that, you know, you could really do all of the training on the job or um, who, what are the populations in their communities that face barriers that they maybe aren't accessing currently? Um, and then who can they partner with to, to find those pipelines of talent and what nonprofits can they partner with potentially to provide some of that wraparound support. Those are the kinds of questions that we explore with employee employers during that training and then afterwards as well. So we so we have the two day immersion. Employers can come spend time on that and then we, you know, give them some resources to help them also like think through the business case and actually get into some of the numbers um, so that they can think about their own cost of hiring and their own retention rates and how um, this can impact their bottom line. Um, So all of that, you know, happens during the learning lab. We then, you know, help companies uh, with actually implementing a pilot, um, if that's something that they're interested in. And then we definitely are are collaborating with our partners on researching the model to understand better the impact, both from a social impact standpoint, as well as, you know, what are the impacts to business metrics, retention, um, cost of hiring, all of that. Um, so we, you know, help the companies and then kind of aggregate the research to, you know, further um, prove the case for the model and, and get the message out. Um, so that's kind of a, a summary of what we're doing at the center. 
And, and I imagine you're getting the people who want to learn. So you, but they're going to ask the questions. So you say they get all their questions out of the way. Um, but is there pushback that you've gotten from companies that you've t- spoken to? Maybe they're not ready for the learning lab, but just some quick, like, oh, it'll never work. Like, what, what are some challenges that you get? Because I, I, just to preface this, this question, um, I mentioned talking to you guys. I was like, they do this really cool process called open open hiring and someone said isn't that illegal like just like it sounds like I would guess not uh, but there's just it's such a even though you've been doing it so long it's such a new and foreign concept for a lot of yeah. U.S. employers so what pushback do you get um so I can clarify it is it is not legal <laughs> if it Sorry, it is not illegal. illegal. Okay. <laughs> let's, do, let's try that again. Yeah. I can clarify. <laughs> it is not illegal. Um, and if it were, we would not be in business. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly we get pushback. I mean, the big one is is around, you know, managing risk and this this perception that, you know, what we do is is riskier and, you know, not to generalize about HR professionals, but, you know, many of them are understandably concerned with risk. And so the the messaging that we use to address that concern is, you know, just, just because you do background checks doesn't mean that you don't, you know, don't necessarily have employees who have committed crimes in their past. The background checks tell you who got caught. Um, and businesses should have systems and processes in place to manage whatever the risks are that they face, no matter who they're hiring. We have those processes in place. Others do as well. And if they don't, they should think about how they are managing that risk. And, you know, we, as we mentioned before, haven't had any of those, you know, crazy incidents that people that may come to people's minds. We have the, you know, exact same challenges as any other, any other employer. And then, you know, I think the other, you know, issue that comes up is, well, this thing I met, you know, what I mentioned around, you know, well, we can't go fully open hiring. That's just too far for us. And if we're not going to adopt the model fully, then it's not for us. Um, and we definitely want to dispel that myth because we're, we want to work with and support employers who are removing any barriers to employment and really just help them think through what are they requiring for their roles and do those requirements really make sense? Even something as simple as the job description and how it's written, is that creating a barrier for certain people to apply? Things like that. Yeah, and I, I imagine like humanizing some of these people. Like, I, cause I think some people say like my family, I've got a close family member who has a criminal record. And it, to me, like you, when you see, when you hear someone having a criminal record, you, you just automatically get this picture that they're dangerous and, you know, they don't want to work. And, you know, he is the hardest worker at his organization in his department, um, but he's scared to ever leave because he knows how hard it would be to find a job with that, his record. Um, and, and I just think that humanizing them to people, that they are people that we know, and there's a lot of good people <laughs> that, that I just, I think that companies may just want to categorize them this one way and stereotype them. So that's why I just love that, that Dion getting up and talking. And, yeah. 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 and also like, you know, these are someone coming out of the criminal justice system has done their time. And so right. do we really want to further punish them and not give them access to employment and likely create, you know, more problems in our communities by doing so? And the other, and the thing I would add to that, Jen, is, you know, going back to, you know, how Bernie got started and we all suffer if we don't hire that person because what happens if someone comes out of whether they're a returning citizen or whatever they might be and they come back to society and they can't get a job now what they go on public assistance or maybe they're committing crimes or somehow or another they are taxing the system as opposed to someone who's now working and contributing to you know the thriving of that community and of that system so that's one myth that i think we need to bust the other one is an additional one that we need to bust is you know we talk about you know human services and humanizing people, and I just want to make sure folks folks are very clear about that. This is not a program. This is not something that even costs. I would actually say it's a cost reallocation because we're not spending to keep people out. We're spending to keep people in. So we're investing in our people as opposed to excluding folks that don't even work here. So I think folks need to understand that piece of it as well. This is a business model, and it's a way to hire folks and a way to keep folks and to have them grow within your organization. So as as we're talking about all these great things and positive you know developments that we've had since we've been in operation, like we're still running a business. This is a business model, but it's not one that's an additional cost to the business. It's actually just a cost reallocation of from what you were traditionally doing. 
Mm-hmm. So one thing that's come up for me during this interview is, is, is just a firing or a letting go process because in any organization there's mm-hmm. you know, disciplinary action and you know yep. Yep. typical stuff. So do you do that any differently or is it just like if you're not, you know, if you're not able to perform? Yeah, I mean, again, it's a business and we have a point <laughs> system that, uh, you know, takes that into account, whether you're showing up late, whether you're not adhering to our goods manufacturing practices, whatever it might be, not calling in. Uh, those are all things that will count against you. So, again, if there is an issue, please bring it to the attention of the employment pathmaker. Bring it to the attention of, you know, our uh, human resources folks or your supervisor so that we can at least address it. Because if we don't know about it, we, I can't help you. But to the extent, you know, we can help you, we will help. But if you're not letting us know, yes, we I mean, we're going to have to, you know, whether it's firing or discipline you somehow, that's just what you would do in any business. I think what sets us apart is we would rather not get to that. Let's talk about what's preventing you from being successful as opposed to just, you know, judging you, <laughs> which is, you know, does happen. And folks are terminated. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and I would say the difference with us is, like I said it before, is that we don't judge you coming in and we're not going to judge you going out. And even when we do have to, unfortunately, terminate folks, you know, and better luck next time. We hope that um, we want you to be successful, but right now you can't work for us because I need you to show up or I need you to adhere to our practices that are, you know, we have high standards for our world-class customers. Can they get back on the list at a later date or are they? Folks do put their names back on the list. Um, that does happen. And depending on the situation, yes, you will be brought back into the organization. Okay. Thanks for answering that. Um, now, when you think about, oh, actually, before I get to the last question, the foundation, I want to make sure there's proper time and attention given to the foundation. Could you just speak to, because you've mentioned it in, a, in a few ways, and I just want to make people make sure people understand what the mm-hmm, foundation mm-hmm. is and does. Mm-hmm. So the foundation, one, we have the Center for Open Hiring, and Sarah talked about that as well. But we do have uh, workforce development training, and I, I talked about that. Uh, I should just give a bit more detail on that. We offer hard skills training in, in several different areas, whether it's culinary arts, security guard, um, customer service, uh, building and construction, trade safety, and all of these all of these um, courses, you get a nationally recognized certification that you can use you know, anywhere in the country. And we also provide the soft skills piece of it that actually bookends all of our trainings that we offer. Uh, so, you know, interviewing skills, resume writing, conflict resolution, all the different things that um, you also need to, some people say it's smart skills, not soft skills, but just you know, things we might take for granted that um, really helps our clients and supports them along their employment journey. We provide all of that in-house and uh, we've graduated, you know, 80% of the folks that graduate get placed into a job. And as of last year, you know, they're earning, you know, 20% plus above the New York state minimum wage. And they're going into emerging industries in this area that provide, you know, career pathways for them, whether it's hospitality industry. Um, I mentioned the healthcare service and our, our uh, hospital partner. Uh, so we, we offer those services, but we also have the community wellness programming we have a housing facility um, for the chronically homeless with HIV AIDS called Eson House. Um, and we provide, you know, case management and support for the residents that live here. Um, we have a community wellness and environmental education programming that uh, maintains 12 uh, community gardens throughout Southwest Yonkers, but also goes into the schools. About 300 kids get trained in healthy eating habits and how to grow fruits and vegetables. Um, and actually, each of these 12 gardens that are located in Southwest Yonkers, those are all maintained by the respective uh, neighborhoods. So that's that's food for those communities. So, and particularly the, the certain parts of Southwest Yonkers, you know, that's addressing a food insecurity issue. Mm-hmm. So, you know, very true to Bernie's uh, philosophy and spirit is, you know, how do we create opportunities for folks to thrive, whether it's employment whether it's um, healthy eating, you know, whether it's housing, uh, we want to provide those things that will help folks be successful. Yes, that brings me back to my community health days. And I live in North Carolina, so I was in Durham, North Carolina, and we, um, oh. I, was, I was in community health and had coworkers that went into the school systems. And it was just amazing to me. Like when you were just, you obviously grew, I grew up different, um, mm-hmm. exposed to a lot of fruits and vegetables, but, um, yeah, they, the kids didn't know what a blueberry was or like some of the, <laughs> the very basic, you know, like, 
wow, okay. So um, having a community garden makes such a difference because they can see how things are grown and get yeah. and get access to that fresh produce. So it is yeah. uh, that's such good good work. Um, and, and since your audience is interested in health, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the U.S. Surgeon General was here uh, back in December to tour the bakery and to see the facilities and learn more about what we do at Grayston. And he saw the immediate connection to his uh, community health and economic prosperity initiative because um, he sees you know, these types of inclusive hiring practices as being a way to uh, creating thriving communities as well. And as he says, it begins with one job. And he's actually a great ambassador for Grace and I, I didn't even know it until I met him back in December, but um, it was really good to have him here and to have uh, his support. And hopefully we, you'll get to see our name uh, this summer and his report that will be issued um, to, the, to the country. Yes, that's amazing. Oh. Um, so if we had to take everything that you all are doing, everything you've talked about today, and really boiled it down to one thing, that employers, so just thinking from an organization that would listen to this and go, okay, well, what can I do with this information? What would you recommend for them to consider? If they're an employer, if they're anybody, really join us. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, we have our learning lab on March 17th and 18th. Um, reach out to us. You can go to our website, graceton.org, to learn more information. Sarah, and our information, I believe, will be available on your um, website. We'd love to connect with you. And whether you're an employer, whether you're a donor, you know, all of these programming that we do, whether it's the workforce development training or the community wellness training, they require resources. And uh, those resources cost money. So we are always looking for folks to partner with us uh, financially as an employer partner in our center. Uh, we want you to be a part of this journey with us. And we think uh, you get to uh, the critical mass that you want by building coalitions. I'll add one little tidbit. Obviously, we want, you know, as many as we can to, to join us and work with us. But, you know, we we also just want folks to start somewhere. And so I think companies just look at the job description and look at your process for hiring. And is there anything you can remove? Maybe it's a credit check. Maybe it's thinking through how you do the interview and, you know, focusing more on forward-looking questions rather than asking about someone's past. Or maybe it's high school degree requirement. Do you really need a high school degree to assemble and pack boxes, for example? Um, I think just taking a hard look at all of those potential barriers and starting somewhere um, is what I would recommend. Uh, great advice. And, and I want to put a plug in that you can buy the brownies. You can buy your brownies and give them for gifts. Yeah. Yeah. And so as I was doing my research, I was like, oh, I wish I would have known because I know we're wellness people, but I love a good brownie. And I would love to recommend to my audience is like, go just buy a gift and support Grayson because that is uh, another easy way. In moderation, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, moderation. Now, now the, now the businessman in me is saying, you know, we had a very good um, year last year in terms of corporate gifts, and I understand Valentine's Day is coming up. So, you know, you can go to our website and purchase browniesgrayston.org uh, for, you know, that special someone. <laughs> yes, or someone, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Joe, Sarah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, explaining the open hiring process and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there.